Hello, everybody, and uh, this is Rob Hirschfeld. I want to guide you through troubleshooting video for, for Digital Rebar. Uh, and I have the whole team here um, to help figure out what's going on with my Digital Rebar instance and, and sort of walk through what you would normally look at for um, you know, asking for help from RackN and, and what type of questions we'd want to know. Um, and so I've, I've created a simple system. Right now, it's not causing any problems. We, we, don't, we won't inject any, any intentional issues. Uh, the first thing that I would be looking at here, and, and usually what we want to know, is the version that you have for the system. So I'm on the UX. I'm, I'm, I'm navigated to Info and Preferences, and I can see not just my version, but my endpoint ID, my operating system. I can see all of the content versions of pieces that I've installed. So I can make sure that not only is the version of Digital Rebar up to date, but I can check to make sure that the content packs that I have are also up to date. Um, in this case, you can actually, in, you can see if there are updates available. So in this, this case, I've got 4.6, which is the very latest, and the stable release is a version behind that. And that's showing up very clearly here. Uh, you can also see a whole bunch of logging information where I've collected, um, I've started with our base logging, and I could ramp this up if I'm having a different problem. Uh, Greg or Victor, when when I look at ramping up logging, is there something that's more useful to consider from this perspective and turning on lo different logs? Well, for the kind of the area you're looking to lo log, like if you're having a DHCP issue, you can turn on the DHCP logs. There's rendering logs for when you're looking at what templates might be rendered or if your template's having an error. Um, and then the same with if you're having a plugin issue. The logs allow you to choose that. These, this logging represents the DRP logging that comes out in the logs view in the UX in the bottom. Okay, and so when I hit save there, it's gonna then turn on that, that different logging is there any reason why I wouldn't just turn everything to trace from that perspective? Is that helpful? Uh, you will fill up your logs real quick if you do that. So I could actually make it harder to figure out a problem if I just max every max trace to everything. Yes, because then you won't be able to find the needle that you're looking for in the uh, you know blizzard full of haystacks that'll be blowing around. So from that perspective, the reason these are split is because you don't want to just say, oh, I'm going to turn all my logs to trace and, and hope I find it. That, would, that literally would obfuscate a real issue. So what you want to do is be more selective about where that error is occurring in the product and then turn up the logging for that. Would it be okay to sort of make info as a general, like make everything info? Or is that, would that cause too much noise? Uh, I generally just leave everything at error if I'm not actively hunting for something. Okay. So. That makes sense. And I know that some things like DHCP, when you turn it to trace, you're almost getting packet log tracing. It's, that's you really, are getting really more than packet log tracing with DHCP if you set it to trace. Okay. So definitely people should be wary before they, they jack all the logs up. You should step it uh, carefully if you can and, and see where things are going. That makes That makes a lot of sense to me. How is so? If I was, if I make these these changes, uh, that is that going to show up in the logs area here? Do I have to go anywhere else? Yeah, it shows up there. It shows up pretty much immediately there. Any okay. changes that may, that are made. So I can so from the UX, I could actually start seeing any any logging behavior I'm going to see is is in here. I'm going to go over to CLI and we're going to do this command line also. In a minute, but just just grabbing things out of the UX, it's going to be show up right here too. Yeah, that also highlights another issue with uh, cranking all the logs up to trace by default. Um, the UX only keeps the last two thousand log entries. Um, anything past that gets lost. So if you have logging turned up, you can actually scroll past something before you can actually focus on it if you're running into problems. That makes sense. These errors are from bringing up a multi-site system. It's actually connecting in and then reconciling itself as we get real live logging uh, coming out. And then the job log over here is a really good way for people to check out what's going on. So as the system runs, everything in the, every, every workflow activity generates these job logs. Um, how do, you know, are these useful for diagnostics? 
Very much so. <laughs> if uh, anything is going wrong with a job, this is where you'll find it. How it's and how? Log. How would I know, like, if it's a job-related thing? Like, if I'm provisioning an OS and I'm having trouble with a boot env, is it going to show up in the job logs? If you're having trouble with the boot env, no, generally not. Right, because those are happening from a template renderer and just being file rendered. Well, so would mm -hmm. I look in the logs? So that's a render error that I could then boost the logging levels, yeah. and then that might show up there. Correct. Okay. Or checking the machine object for errors. Yeah. So in the machine object itself, if I was to pick one of these machine objects, what you're saying is I can look. They'll, they'll show up in the UX. They also show up um, here in the errors of, of the object itself, and I'm going to be able to get feedback for that. Yes, depending so. on what the boot end error is, like if the boot end's missing parameters or can't be assigned appropriately because the machine is, you know. That's, that's super convenient. And then that, that same error, every object we have actually has an errors um, item, not in templates, of course. Most of the <laughs> objects that we have, templates are special, have errors also. And if there's any, any, any concerns on that, it will, they'll show up here. And that will actually show up as red. You know, you'll see those uh, highlighted. It happens to me all the time when I'm, when I'm coding against like stages and workflows and I change the dependencies. They'll, you'll see a very clear indication that, that there's an error. And then those errors can be, you can look at, dry, drill in and look at the errors. Um, that reminds me, sometimes when you're using the system, we get a, a whole bunch of errors in the UX um, based out of the endpoint uh, data. What, what is that caused by? Let's see, I think no, I have some in my local, if I log into my local endpoint. Dependency issues. So there's like a stage that's missing a template from another content pack or things like that that are... Uh, content inconsistencies. Okay. And so if I see things in here, do I just, can I, do I ignore that? Just, uh, or or is, these, these are usually things that mean I've upgraded content and I'm missing something that I'm supposed to have. Correct. And I should care about that. Or you have your own content pack and you haven't updated it or it's missing. Or okay. That makes a lot of sense. And that's, that's really helpful as a place to go and find uh, the information here. If I dismiss these, yeah, I'm potentially missing. I was going to talk about the red. So these are those red X's where I have that. These are the same errors that I just saw. They're just on the content pack and we've bubbled them up to the top level because things will break when this happens, when, when you're seeing this as an issue. Right. Okay. That's really, that makes a lot of sense. Um, okay. Are, from the UX, is there another place where people would, would go look for errors or issues if they were having them? I guess we could look in the event log, and the event log will surface errors also uh, coming through if there's problems. Yeah, the, most of those will be in the log for the um, system. Okay. Um, with regard to the job logs themselves, you can see the jobs, and that's often useful. To get additional debugging on a failed job, it's often useful to turn on the RS debug flag, which is a parameter on a machine. And if you set that on a machine, then the many of the tasks, the rack and provided tasks, pay attention to that flag to publish and print out additional um, information. Right. And we have a shortcut for that. If I'm in the params here, I select a machine and, and click the debug item here, that will turn on the debugging action, um, which is your, just like you were saying, set as a parameter down here, RS debug enable true. And I could turn it true or false, or if I just delete it, the default is false. Right. Um, and that, if my goodness, if we turn that on, um, and then I'm just going to run oh, the load generator workflow here. Um, with that turned on, that's going to generate um, a lot more detail in any 
uh, existing workflow. Some of our some of our tasks are generate actually uh, give out additional information if debug is turned on to make troubleshooting easier. So another troubleshooting item is yep. in this view. Stay in this view. Okay. Um, oftentimes, the task will fail, and you'll be like, well, but how does that match up to what was rendered? The template rendering information right below shows all the templates that were rendered for that execution so that you can see this is particularly helpful to match up line numbers because oftentimes the job will fail, say, like, failed at line whatever or rendered whatever at line failure. It's oftentimes easier to find out what the actual line number is by looking at the rendered information because it will already have the template expansions done. For right, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so if it says it failed at line whatever, this is the place where, where it does that. One thing I know that can confuse people though is that when they look at this, this the rendered templates do not stick around for that long. Um, if you're looking for an internal job, how long do we, we actually have access to the rendered templates? It's not so much that access to the rendered templates goes away. It's that the rendered templates themselves depend on the state of the machine at the time it was rendered. So as the machine is going through a workflow and you're changing state on it by updating parameters or whatever, what's in those rent what's rendered into those templates will change in real time that's right okay so that's something for people to keep in mind if if you go back and i can show show this by just picking a job that we had in the past uh it doesn't actually this one still has its rendered information but a lot of times the older job won't have any rendered information in it or that rendered information will just be incorrect right <laughs> from for the time at which the job ran. Okay. It'll be so, correct for now, but it won't be correct for then. Right. So if I, I can actually go through, we have an always fails job. Yep, there it is, top of the list. Um, and did what it's supposed to do and it failed. So what, what Greg is saying in, in here is that it's gonna say it failed at a certain line number. Uh, I'm failing, marked, um, and then I can go look at what that actual render template was and what happened. And get a get a line number out of it, or at least see what the actual code was that executed. Right. Yeah. Here's one of four, and this should be one of four. There you go. Super helpful. Okay. And then, uh, any other UX items, or should we can we jump over into a CLI? Um, those are the use. I mean, that's the usual pass we use for the UX. Okay. And I actually use the UX for this part more than I use the CLI. So one of the things that's that's often helpful is uh, to provide back information in this your this info get. Um, which has the same information we were showing, um, which has a lot more information than we, we show because it includes a whole bunch of scopes, content that's installed, um, some license information to see if your issues are actually related to the license. Um, the other thing, so the other thing I would want to do, this is running as a service, so I should be able to do a uh, general cuddle and look at running logs, right? If I do DR provision. Yep. It's actually a little bit too big from a font perspective. Let me scroll things out. So how helpful is this view if I'm doing, a, if I'm trying to figure out what happened? Is this the same as what I would see if I just went to the logs view from a from the API? It is, but as Victor mentioned, this will have a longer running history than what the UX shows. Okay. Yes. The UX will only show the last 1,000, 2,000 entries. 
where this will show potentially longer term history. And if, if you have your debugging set up high enough, especially like if you're trying to debug a DHCP issue, the longer set of data is useful because you'll get a better. Sometimes you want behavior that only occurs, you know, once every few hours or so. Okay. And then if I was doing uh, a system cut all status, how is this, is this information useful for people also? Certainly it'll tell them if the system's running, um, which is always a good start if they're not, if things yes, are- Yes, it also it, shows which plugins are running. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Okay, and in, out, of, out of the C group? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, that makes a lot of sense and that's important. Um, and then lately we've been doing a lot with context. So Podman uh, PS should show if there's any running processes on here. I can start one just to let people see what that would look like. So if I do a simple runner container, uh, discover base, go and do a dot, uh, podman ps, it's gonna show me that process running. And so if you're expecting context to be running, uh, a lot of times you'd wanna be able to troubleshoot that there's something, there actually is a matching container. And it looks like you can see the machine's UID is, is tacked in on the name. So it's pretty easy to figure out if your context is running correctly or not from that perspective. Yep, all by design. That seems pretty straightforward. Um, so one of the things I know we added was uh, DRP CLI to pull uh, data out. Um, how would I how would I go about doing that? There's a um, I think it's logs. Yep, there is a DRP CLI logs command, and so I can get and watch. Yeah, but there's a new log capture function to DRP CLI support. Hmm, okay. So you have two commands and bundle, which allows you to grab basically the journal cuddle, the various plugin states and stuff like that and bundle it up into a single tarball. And then there's the machine bundle, which allows you to bundle up a specific machine, specific job information and stuff like that. So wow, that would be really helpful. So if, if we're trying to give you help, we rack in trying to help somebody, then this, then you don't have to you know, try and figure out the stuff that we're asking for. You can use this support bundle. And it is, is this work in a way that's not, you don't have to be on the machine. It's a DRP CLI, so it should work from anywhere. Well, for bundle, you'll need to be on the host uh, because it uses the journal cuddle commands okay. to capture the logs. Uh, but machine bundle can be run from anywhere that you can run your uh, DRP CLI from. Cool. Super helpful. That makes a lot of sense. And then the last one, if I'm about to apply a patch, how do I make a backup before I do that? So in your path, once you did your install, you should now have a DR wall tool, DR dash wall. Uh, let's see, DR dash. There you go. And that has a whole bunch of support tools in it. Go ahead and hit enter. One of them is backup. If you see it. Do that, then you can give it um, uh, do dash dash help. You'll see the. Yeah. Okay. Um, you can then get information to tell it where it needs to go, what directory you want to back up, who you want to attach to, because you can then use it to attach to remote systems. You can give it the credentials you want to log in as, and whether you want to back up not just the database, which is what we call the commits, and then it also allows you to back up the artifacts and what 
Rackin refers to as artifacts are the things like your installed content packs, your plugins, your ISOs, your files directory, your job logs. That's not backed up by default. Um, so you can set those flags and you'll get the appropriate thing. The system will do a point in time backup so it'll run um, and gather the information. You can run it again and again and it will do an incremental backup so it attempts to use the um, HA synchronization code that we put in in 4.4 to allow you to quickly get commits backed up so that way it doesn't have to resync the whole sets of trees. It'll pull over what's changed so that you can kind of back do a backup, tar that up and then leave it and then re-back it up but it'll only pull over the differences so that you can do quicker backups. There's, well, that's also, powerful. there's also a mode to leave it running if you wanted to, but um, the default is to do a single point in time. <laughs> At that point, you're almost just as well off to build an HA, a DRP is an HA uh, system. Right. Okay. All right, that, and so, you know, always it's useful <laughs> to know, before you patch a system and put in new code, run a backup, We've, we've been making it really easy to make a backup um, from that perspective. So that's, that's super helpful. Is there one other thing that sometimes people end up messing with is they do jump into uh, the file locations. So if I actually wanted to see the ERP, like you can't go into the store, the stores anymore, like you used to be able to and mess with the backing objects because of the wall. What can people see if they jump into the, the, the actual directory? Uh, which I think, where is my? It's is this bar. playing with fire or? Bar life. Yeah, in general, you don't really want to go into there. And, but the. Oh, yes, far lib. Var lib. Our provision is usually default on a production system unless you move it. Okay. And in there, you'll see your certificate and key. Those are useful if you wish to replace them with your own signed certificate and key. But like that's the self signed generated key for the server. Then you have a job logs directory, which is useful for, which holds the job logs separate from the actual rest of the data. You have endpoints which contain the data that's replicated for manager for the each end of, end of point. There's a plugins and a SAS content directory. These are your plugins and your contents directories where those are your stored content packs and stuff like that. There's a plugin tempter. That's a directory that the plugins use local Unix domain sockets to communicate to DRP. The replace directory allows you to replace things in the TFTP boot directory that are embedded in DRP itself. Things like if you needed to replace the bootloader for a particular system, you could do that. I don't have any set up in this system. Okay. And that's helpful. There's a, there's already. Yeah. yeah. Re replaces for pretty specialized needs. Generally, I wouldn't mess with anything in it until you've talked with uh, yeah. us in a support capacity. Right. Then that makes there, sense, but this, but this allows you to make, allows you to make specialized things that then don't impact the normal distribution that you're going to get, which is really powerful. Yeah. Okay. And then the remaining directory is the TFTP boot directory. This is actually the root of the published file system that DRP is serving as a read-only file system. The changes to be done to this space is controlled through the files and ISOs API. So those are the only things that are accessible for read write under the API subsystem. And then all the rest of these directories are managed by DRP itself through the ISO explosion or as part of starting up DRP where it replaces these sets of files as is. Makes sense. So if, if somebody's finding themselves mucking around in these files, Give us a call before you before you make changes. It's uh, not not there are right. a few places where you want to. Okay. So, for example, like in the files case, um, 
a lot of times if you're like using image deploy, you may, you could use DRP's files API to image deploy, but you also may choose to do um, file links or other things to copy those into locations. Mm -hmm. so that, okay. Uh, if they're large images for your like image deploy process. So you could, you could drop it in the right location. So you could, you could drop something into the um, uh, TFTP files. And then right, you can see, I have a couple of things already there. Um, but in general, the files API is how you want to access this space, but there's a few cases where you might choose to do otherwise. Excellent. Cool. I, that's a lot of sort of navigation for people. Our goal with this uh, video was so that if you are trying to fix something in digital rebar, one, we wanted to give you some tips on how you can self-diagnose problems. And then, you know, in the back half of this, you know, sort of provide you with some tools that are going to be the things that we, we go to and then we ask for for help. Any last items for people to consider when they when they look at the the, the system? I don't have anything off the top of my head. That's excellent. Uh, so, if, and if you have questions, please just ask us in Slack. We we do try to make it easy, and we're always working to improve the experience of troubleshooting and, and upgrading and patching. So thank you.